Hey everybody, welcome to the first seminar of quarantine. My name is Michael Greenberg and I'll be talking a little bit about supercomputing. Both the general principles of supercomputing, how to use a supercomputer, and a little bit about how we specifically provide supercomputing on campus. So first off, what is supercomputing? Um, it's really nothing special. It's essentially running work on a supercomputer. So that could mean, for example, that I want to run an optic simulation uh, to figure out the properties of a mirror, but the simulation is gonna take too much memory or too, much, too many CPUs for my machine to, uh, to handle it. Maybe I need a terabyte total of memory and 100 cores. In a case like that, I would wanna use a supercomputer, which is really just a collection of strong computers to run that simulation. So essentially, it's just a place with a lot of compute resources where users can run arbitrary work within batch jobs. And the Office of Research Computing, that's us, we provide supercomputing resources to BYU. So that's faculty, staff, students, and some collaborators who are working with our professors. We also provide support for the supercomputer so if you ever need any help in using it, feel free to give us a call or open a ticket. So who, who uses supercomputers? Traditionally, it's been a lot of uh, physicists, chemists, engineers, and in the past 20 years or so, quite a few more fields have kind of started using supercomputers. For example, geneticists and other life scientists have uh, started using them in earnest lately to do genetic sequencing, protein folding, that sort of thing. Um, economists and statisticians also use supercomputers. Uh, the government uses them. And machine learning of late has exploded. Maybe in the past, I don't know, five years or so, there's been a lot of machine learning and artificial intelligence that happens on supercomputers. All right. So, like I said earlier, a supercomputer is really just a collection of computers. These are the same as the computers that you have at home when it comes to when it comes to the basics. It's really just a motherboard with a CPU, some memory, and some storage. And these computers that constitute the supercomputer, they might be quite a bit stronger than your average, I guess, desktop machine or laptop, but at a fundamental level, they really are the same as your computer. And some of these nodes that we have have accelerators like GPUs and Xeon Phi's. And we don't have any field programmable gate arrays, but a lot of supercomputing centers have those. And what these accelerators do is they speed up a job, um, but only when you have a pretty a pretty specific computing profile. So for example, GPUs, because they're really good at doing single instruction, multiple data, they're exceptionally good for matrix multiplication, which is why a lot of the time for machine learning and artificial intelligence, where there's a lot of matrix manipulation, you'll see that GPUs speed those sort of computations up quite a bit. Um, Xeon Phi, we have a few of those as well. And those are good for similar things where it's a lot of, a lot of number crunching. Um, but they didn't win the marketing battle with NVIDIA. So most of, our, most of our accelerator nodes have GPUs. All right, like I said, the supercomputer is just composed of a bunch of smaller computers or nodes. So the big speed up doesn't come from each computer being exceptionally fast. As a matter of fact, the clock speeds on our supercomputer on all of our nodes are quite a bit lower than some consumer hardware. So I believe that most of them are below three gigahertz. So a supercomputer doesn't have any terrible speed advantage, I suppose. What really enables it to be super is the parallelism. So we have about 1,000 nodes and 20,000 processors in our supercomputer. So parallelism is really how you 
how you gain an advantage over a regular computer. And in the ideal case, code can parallelize perfectly. We call it embarrassingly parallel. Um, and the an analog for this would be putting a bunch of bricks on one side of campus and giving 100 people wheelbarrows. And each of these people can independently load bricks and take them across campus and deposit them on the other side. And because we have 100 people to do that, it's going to be approximately 100 times as fast as if we just had one person with a wheelbarrow shuttling bricks across campus. In the real world, though, there's usually some communication and coordination that's required between processes. So this would be more like a puzzle. Let's say if you have eight, person, eight people working on a puzzle, that doesn't mean it's going to be completed eight times as fast. Maybe you'll have a three times speed up or so, but because of that communication and coordination requirement, the speed up isn't going to scale linearly with the amount of people that are helping. So one of the big challenges of using a supercomputer is figuring out how to use parallelism to speed up your work. Uh, there's really two ways to do that. Maybe you have a thousand small tasks that need to be run, and that will be embarrassingly parallel because they don't need to communicate with each other. It's quite a bit harder when you have a big simulation that on a single processor would require, say, six months. In that case, you have to figure out how to parallelize it well. So coming up with the algorithms to, I guess, better parallelize workflow is one of the big challenges of supercomputing. All right, this is just a quick little diagram of how the supercomputer is organized. So we access the supercomputer via SSH. And essentially what this is doing is you're opening an internet connection, or I guess a tunnel, from your computer to the login node over the internet. And SSH, it's secure shell. So what you're getting there is a, a text terminal where you can type commands. So I'll go ahead and show that real quick. All right. So to avoid screen flicker, I have to do the sharing a little bit differently here. Just a moment. There it is. OK, so I've got my terminal here. When I want to log into the supercomputer over SSH, like I was saying, I'm just going to say SSH, my net ID at ssh.rc.byu.edu. Once I do that, it's going to prompt me for a password and then a verification code. This is the six digit code that you'll get off of your phone um, on whichever authentication app you happen to download. Most people use Google Authenticator or Duo for this, but really you can use, you can use pretty much any two-factor authentication app. All right, so I've logged into the supercomputer. And as you can see, this is just a normal Unix prompt right here. I can see where I am. I can navigate. So this is just a simple Linux shell that we've got here. All right, let me reshare this screen for you. Okay, so you see that I'm on login 01 here. This is one of the login nodes that we've got. So this is really your interface to the supercomputer. When you log in, you get dropped there on the login node. And this is where you're gonna do, want to do things like looking at your data, submitting jobs, downloading and uploading things from the internet. Oh, and I should quickly mention that we've had a lot of people who have confusion because they'll try to download things from compute nodes. For security reasons, the compute nodes are not connected to the internet. So if you want to do any downloading or any uploading, you're going to have to do that from the login node. 
All right, so from the login nodes, we submit jobs via Slurm to the compute nodes. So essentially what this is, is you're telling Slurm, this is the work that I want to do. Um, go ahead and schedule it on one of these compute nodes or several of these compute nodes if I ask for them. Here are the resources I need. I need, you know, six CPUs, eight gigabytes of memory for six hours. And Slurm will go ahead and figure out where on the compute nodes my job can run. It'll schedule it, it'll run it there, and it'll tell me when the job is, when the job is finished. So because we have the compute nodes, and because there are only four login nodes, and we have somewhere on the order of a thousand users, we really want to emphasize that you should be doing your computing on the compute nodes. So it's fine to do, for example, tarring of data, zipping, moving things around on the login nodes, but any heavy computing that you do there will be killed. So we have a one hour time limit, or a one hour CPU time limit on processes that run on the login nodes. And again, things like gzip, rsync, moving things around, those are exempted from that one hour time limit. But if you try to do any real number crunching there, it won't work. So just make sure to submit your, your real computing via a job. All right, so the storage, we have common storage, and this is exported over the network to all of the nodes. So you'll notice when I come back to my terminal here that I've got I've got um, some directories here listed that I can see from this node. And because, again, we have those, that storage system exported over the network, you can see these from whichever node you happen to be on. So I'm on login one right now, and this is what I can see. But if I head over to another node using Salic, this will put me on a compute node. You'll see in a moment here that I have access to all the same files and directories. So this is really nice because it means that we, you don't have to worry about shuttling your data back and forth between the login nodes and the compute nodes, or between particular compute nodes, or between particular login nodes. All right, so that is the general overview of how the supercomputer works. Let's go ahead and talk about how to use software on the supercomputer and how to access software there. Most of the basic Unix software that you would expect is available by default. So you don't have to load any modules or anything or do anything special to access most of your, I guess you could call them your normal commands. So if I want to access some, use something like gzip, I can just run the command and it'll go for me. And this is true of most common things. rsync, for example, we can just use directly. But if you want to do more niche computing software, you're gonna to want to use the module system. And the module system is a way to, I guess, control access to software in such a way that it's easy to, well, let me make sure that I'm sharing the right screen here. Oh, I'm not. Apologies for the flicker there, if there was any. Okay. So uh, the module system, it keeps all of the software distinct. This is an advantage for if you want multiple versions of a particular piece of software, or if software would perhaps conflict with other software. So as an example, let's say I want to use the compiler GCC. And maybe I want a particular version that isn't installed by default. 
So by default, we have GCC 4.8.5, which is pretty old, installed on the supercomputer. So if I want a newer version of this, I can use module load GCC, let's say nine, for example. And I will have a newer version. Oh, whoops, module list is what I was looking for there to show you what I have loaded. Now I'm gonna have a newer version of GCC. So let's say I have an old, old piece of software that I need to compile from source and it requires GCC5, for example. I can go ahead and load that older version and it'll automatically get replaced here. So the module system, again, it allows us to kind of isolate these pieces of software. So you, can, you only have access to what you need and your software isn't gonna get confused by conflicting commands from another software package, for example. And again, this also allows us to keep multiple versions accessible at the same time. All right, let's go back to presentation here. So module load, as you just saw, that's how we load software. Module unload works much in the same fashion. I could say module unload GCC and it would be out of my environment and I would no longer have access to that. The problem is sometimes you don't know whether software is installed or if it is where to look for it. And that's when module spider comes into play. Module spider is how we figure out whether software is installed and how we can figure out how to load that software. So as an example, let me try to load up VMD here. That's visual molecular dynamics. If I just try to load it, it's not gonna show up. The nice thing is mo the module system knows which modules exist. So it says these modules exist but cannot be loaded as requested, VMD. Module spider is how I find out how I need to load VMD, for example. So if I say module spider VMD, it's gonna go ahead and tell me that it exists. It's gonna tell me which version is available. And it's gonna tell me how to figure out exactly how to load this version. So let's go ahead and run that command, module spider VMD 1.9. And it tells me that I need to load all the modules on any of these lines before I can load VMD. So let's go ahead and take this newest version here. It says we're gonna to need to load GCC9 and MPICH 3.3. So once we've got those loaded, I should be able to load up VMD here. And it looks like we were successful. And now I can run VMD successfully. All right, I'm not sure how to uh, exit this, so we'll just go ahead and do this. But you'll see once I module purge to get rid of that module, I can no longer run VMD. So this allows you to kind of keep your environment pretty clean. One thing I should mention because it has caused confusion in the past is that these changes to your module, I guess, environment, are not reflected the next time you log in. So right now, I don't have anything loaded, but if I were to log in or log out and then log back in again, I would be starting on a clean slate. I would have that default env and lmod module loaded, just like I had originally. So if you wanna make persistent changes, you can go ahead and look at the environment modules page on our wiki. All right, so software installation, if it's going to be a pretty commonly used piece of software, we tend to install it centrally and we make a module for it. 
If your software is pretty niche though, and it's likely that you're gonna be the only one using it, we ask that you try to at least try to install it yourself from source, or perhaps just download a generic Linux binary. Unfortunately, because traditional uh, software or package managers require root to be used, for example, apt or yum, we don't allow users to, uh, to use those package managers. So again, if you want software installed, you'll either have to find a generic binary or install it yourself from source. And source installation is generally pretty simple. You just download the source, which will generally come in a tarball. You extract that source. You go into the source directory. And there should be either a configure script or a CMake script, something along those lines. You'll run configure or you'll run CMake. Then you'll run make, and your software has been compiled and built, and you can use it from there. If you do end up trying to install software, and it takes you more than, say, I don't know, an hour or two, and the normal steps or instructions on GitHub or whatever don't happen to be working, please open a ticket with us or give us a call or something, and we should be able to walk you through most software installations. So some users, because their, I guess their needs are so unique, they have to write their own software. And if you do end up writing your own software, we encourage you to optimize for speed from the beginning. And I know that it's said that optimizing prematurely is uh, one of the roots of all evil, but in this case, you really don't wanna shoot yourself in the foot. You don't necessarily have to be thinking about very minute optimization details at the beginning, but it helps to keep in mind what kind of performance you're looking for and the algorithm that you have uh, that you have to work with. So one thing to keep in mind is to choose an appropriate language. So if you're looking for performance, which on the supercomputer, you if you're using the supercomputer, obviously you're wanting performance, you should try to use a uh, language that isn't gonna hamstring you. So these are mostly gonna be compiled languages, C, C++, Fortran. Um, one of the recent players on the scene is Julia. And if you do use one of these languages from the start, it's gonna be a lot less of a headache later when you're trying to squeeze out as much performance as you can. And I just wanna put in a, a plug for Julia real quick. Julia is pretty simple to use. It's a scripting language kind of like Python with similarly easy syntax, but it's surprisingly fast without the uh, programmer having to put in too much effort. So if you're just starting out on a new project or maybe you're thinking about retooling an old piece of software that you have, I highly recommend looking at Julia because it's pretty likely that it'll be able to work for whatever you need. Um, and again, just choose the appropriate, appropriate language for what you're doing. So for example, if you're doing something operating system-like, obviously you're gonna wanna use C or something along those lines. If you're doing a lot of heavy matrix work where you have to have pretty low level access to the hardware, Fortran would be a good choice. And languages like Python, R, Bash, those are really nice to use. Um, they're pretty simple to write in with the exception of Bash and are fairly powerful. The problem is they're not very performant on their own. So we recommend only using those for prototyping and code that sort of glues your performant pieces of software together. And that's not to say that they're bad all the time. For example, if you're using NumPy in Python and that's the only computationally intense part of your program, that sort of thing is just fine. But keep in mind the uh, limitations of those sort of programs. Another thing that you wanna optimize for is memory. 
A lot of the programs that run on the supercomputer use a ton of memory. Uh, that's why we have a couple of nodes that have a terabyte and a half of, of memory. So you want to be pretty careful to keep your memory usage as low as you can, because that'll get you, get you through the queue faster, meaning that your work will be scheduled by Slurm faster. And you'll also want to have good data locality. And what that means is if I am sequentially accessing a bunch of different pieces of data, I want them to be very close to each other in memory. The reason for that is every time I want to access memory, if it's not already stored in the processor's cache, it has to be fetched from, from the RAM, which is a very slow operation. And if you're doing that, for example, 10 times as often as you need to, your performance is going to suffer significantly. So if you're iterating over some data, try to make sure that that data is as compact as possible. And this means that you're going to want to use data-oriented programming rather than object-oriented programming. And this is, a whole, this is a whole field of its own, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. But if you look up data-oriented programming, you should find some pretty good resources for helping your program go a little bit faster and keep the gaping maw of the CPU satisfied. Another thing to be careful about is file I.O. So this is input and output, essentially. And the basic principle is you want to open and close files as seldom as possible, and you want to read and write in big chunks. So this means, if you can, optimize your workflow for very few large files. So what you want to do is, if you have to access a file, you'll open it once. And if it's not a huge file and you have the memory for it, try to read it in all at once and then close the file and be done with it. Don't touch it again. And obviously this is easier said than done sometimes, but the principle is, again, don't be opening and closing files too much and don't use a lot of small files. All right, so our storage systems, we've got essentially three storage systems on the supercomputer. So we've got your home directory, and that's where you get put when you SSH in. Um, and that is pretty small and not terribly performant, but it is backed up. So we recommend putting data, um, data that you need for papers, important results, um, your software itself, in your home directory. The compute directory is a lot bigger and a lot faster, but it isn't backed up. So this is where you want to do, I guess most of your computing is in your compute directory. But once you get your results and your important data, we recommend moving that back to your home directory. Um, Cause you'd be surprised at how often things are accidentally deleted and uh, we need to restore from backup. Um, so slash temp, this is actually local to the node. So each of those thousand nodes has its own unique slash temp. So I'll go ahead and just show an instance of this real quick. And because of that screen flicker, I've got to do, I got to do one window at a time here. There we go. Okay. Well, apparently control D is not the way. All right, so let's see what I've got in here. Um, so in this temp directory, which is the hard drive on this login to node, I've got something called asdf.txt apparently, um, and just a couple other miscellaneous files. But if I head on over to another node, Let's just go to one of the compute nodes to show you. That temp is going to be different. So I've got this stats gather.log. Uh, I think this is for Slurm to collect some statistics, essentially. So if you are doing any computing out of slash temp, 
you have to make sure to copy all of your data over to temp when you start the job. And then once you're done with the job, copy it back, or at least copy the results back to wherever you want to store them long term. Because as soon as your job is over, you no longer have access to those, to those files. That's also good to keep in mind when you have multi-node jobs, for example, with MPI. Not everything is going to have access, I guess, different processes in your program are going to have access to different slash temp. So if you're using MPI, you probably will want to use compute to store everything during that time. What is the benefit of doing computations in the temp folder? Here, sorry, I had my volume down. Could you repeat that one more time? What are the benefits of doing computations in the temp folder? Temp is much, much faster. I actually have a little program here that I'm going to show you. Um, but yeah, slash temp, because it doesn't have to get files over the network, is really quick. So rather than you know going and asking the storage system itself over the network for whatever file, the CPU can just go right to the right to the hard drive on that node or the solid state drive and grab the file directly. So it can be way faster. And if you have a program where you don't have any control over, over the I.O. patterns, for example, if you're, you're using something that someone else compiled, uh, temp is a good way to kind of, I guess, put a bandage over bad I.O. patterns. Most of the time, if you're smart about how you, how you work with your files, you don't have to worry about um, speed problems if you're going out of compute. But if the I.O. pattern is, is bad, slash temp can speed you up quite a bit. So let's see, I've got, yeah, demonstrate storage capability. So I don't, maybe that's not terribly helpful. Essentially what this is going to do is it's just going to do some writes and reads or maybe just writes. Yeah, it's just going to be writes to files in my home directory, my compute directory, and slash temp. And this is just to demonstrate the, uh, I guess, surprising differences in speed here. And unfortunately, this isn't going to show, I guess, how much more performant compute is. Because the real advantage of compute is being able to access lots of files for lots of users all at once. So without really stressing it, I can't show you how much faster it really is than your home directory. <clears throat> but you can see even right here that it is significantly faster. So this single one gigabyte write, that's just writing a one gigabyte file to wherever this is. So that's a very good IO profile. If you can buffer all of your writes and just push them out all at once, um, that'll get you, I guess, pretty quick writing. So you'll see here when I do a thousand one kilobyte writes, it takes a lot more time. Um, and keep in mind that we're writing a hundred times as much data in the case of the one gigabyte file, but these one kilobyte files take way longer. Um, than this. This is about, you know, an order of magnitude of difference here. So you can write a lot more data a lot faster if you're smart about it and you write the data in big chunks. Um, so this is, this is the best way to write files right here. Um, if you're having to append to whatever file that you're working with, it's really the difference between something like this for I in say one to 10. So yeah, this is just printing some numbers. And the naive way to do this, if we want to put it into a file is within the for loop, we'll go ahead and just append it to whatever file. So this right here, this is the foolish way of writing things, I suppose. Um, and you'll see that this is really where slash temp shines. 
um, it it kicked home and computes but right here. Um, and that's because it doesn't have to go over the network just to write a single file. Um, but of course, you still should be trying to do buffered writes, which would be something like this. So you see here how we've done all of our work. And, and then at the end, we put it into our file. So that's going to be the fast, good way to do stuff. And if anybody has any questions about IO patterns, I'll go into that a little bit more at the end of, uh, at the, end of the presentation, if you'd like. All right, let's go ahead and go back to the presentation here. All right, so schedulers. Uh, these, I guess, control who has access to the compute nodes at any given time. So if it was just a free-for-all and anybody could just log into whichever compute node they wanted and start their work, uh, there would be serious, I guess, resource contention problems. Um, so a scheduler, it controls access to limited resources. And the things it takes into account are how much computation have you been doing lately? How long have you been waiting in the queue? How big are your jobs? Are you using private hardware? Are you using a particular quality of service that could maybe get you faster access to resources? So when you submit a job to the scheduler, it figures out, it takes all of this, puts it through an algorithm, the uh, Fair tree algorithm is what we use. And this was written by our own, our very own Ryan Cox and Levi Morrison. Um, that algorithm, I guess, determines when your job should start relative to everyone else's. So it determines some, some definition of fairness and it starts your job when it decides it's fair to do so. So we use Slurm, as many of you probably already know. And I'll go ahead and give a little demonstration or two on how to use that. All right. So there are two commands that you're going to want to use to interact with Slurm and submit jobs. There's sbatch, and this submits a batch job, which means you submit some sort of script and Slurm will go ahead and take that script and run it somewhere. So with sbatch, we have to tell it what kind of resources we want to use. So these little pound sbatch directives right here tell it how much time, how many CPUs, how much memory we want to use. And there are far more flags than this. For example, if I wanted GPUs, I could specify that. If I wanted to run on a particular partition, I could specify that. If I wanted to have AVX2, because I'm doing a lot of number crunching, I could specify that as well. Um, and you can use the man page for sbatch if you want to go through all the different flags. And this is quite the big man page. But you'll find really anything that you could want here. I would imagine. All right, so let's just go ahead and submit this job right here. And to do that, we're just going to say sbatch and then the name of the script. And then it tells me we've submitted a batch job, whatever the number is. And it looks like it's already completed. And it ran on M8173, which is one of the compute nodes. And it used one CPU and one gigabyte of memory, just like we told it to right up here. It turns out that you can also override or supplement the flags that you have in the script with command line flags. So maybe I actually want two CPUs for this job. If I say end tasks two here on the command line, that'll override what we have here within the script itself and it'll run with two CPUs. Are we done yet? Yes. All right, so it looks like this one did use those two CPUs and it ran on the same node as it turns out. 
All right, so that's sbatch. If you want an interactive shell on a node, salloc is what you want. And I used this a little bit before, but it takes most of the same flags that sbatch does. So let's say I want 10 minutes and three CPUs across two nodes with 32 megabytes of memory per CPU. So now I've got a shell on one of these compute nodes. And right here, I've given myself almost no resources. So whatever I'm doing, I could probably have done on the login nodes. But this is more for the case where you have to run something interactively, but it needs a lot of compute power. So for example, let's say that I have, I have to run Stata and I need to run a command that's gonna take four hours observe, I guess, look at the output of that command to decide what to do next, and then submit another command that's gonna take two hours. salloc is for, I guess, that sort of job. So let's see, s control show host names. So yeah, we're running on two nodes here. And again, with salloc or sbatch, you can run on quite a few nodes. You can use quite a few CPUs. Just make sure to know, I guess, the limitations of your, of your software. For example, if your software doesn't specifically say that it can use GPUs, it probably can't. And that could, in theory, speed things up um, if your software is written for it. But make sure that it is actually written for it so that you can use the resources that you that you do request. All right. Let's head on back. All right, so this is a little bit more on the uh, on the scheduler itself. So when there's a lot of jobs that need to be scheduled scheduled and there's limited resources we need to be able to efficiently fill that space. And the smaller and shorter those jobs are, the easier it is for the scheduler to, uh, to I guess, schedule those jobs. So in this little illustration here, uh, each one of these rows is a node. node. So this is you know, node zero, node one, node two, and these little blocks represent time. So what this means is that node and not has a job right now on it that's running and it's gonna take five hours. And two has one that's gonna take uh, like 12 or 13 hours, whatever this is. Um, and these right here, the yellow and the purple, those are multi-node jobs on N3, N4, and N5, N6. So let's say a new user comes along and submits a short job that requires a lot of nodes. Obviously it can't start until this job on N2 has finished. So it gets scheduled for 14 hours out or however long this is. Let's say now that you submit a job that is gonna take 18 hours. Um, the problem is it's not gonna be able to run until after this new user's job that's using all of these nodes. So if we break this job up a little bit more, say we reduce the wall time to six hours, there are a lot of places that it can run. For example, it can run right here, or it can run in any of these spots. So reducing the wall time on your job and reducing how many resources it uses can dramatically speed up uh, how fast you're able to get through the queue on the supercomputer. All right, that's all I've got for you guys. Do you have any questions? Is there anything that anyone would like me to go over in a little bit more detail? All right, if not, I'm gonna go through the website a little bit and show you some of the resources that we have there. As soon as I share the right screen here. This is the one. All right, so when you come to our website, here's what you'll see. 
It's, oh, what does SLRM stand for? Shoot, there were questions. I was not looking at chat. I'm sorry, you guys. Let me go back to uh, let me go back to the terminal here because I think that's going to be the easiest way to show all this. Okay, there we go. All right, first question is, what terminal do you suggest for a PC or Windows machine? Um, I honestly like the one that it comes with. So if you just hit the start button and press CMD, um, in recent versions of Windows 10, I think since somewhere around the middle of last year, you can use SSH directly. And I don't think it has quite as many capabilities as Unix SSH, but you should be able to do most of the things that you need with that, um, with the SSH that you find just in the normal command prompt for Windows. Yeah, Windows subsystem for Linux is also very nice. I would recommend looking into that. Um, it's surprising how much progress they've made with the Windows subsystem over the past year. It's a lot more capable than it used to be if anybody um, turned away from it because it wasn't, wasn't powerful enough for their needs. All right, what does SLRM stand for? Um, it's one of those like fake acronyms where they decided what they wanted the acronym to be and then slapped some words together to, uh, to fit that acronym. It's the energy drink in Futurama. Um, nothing, too, nothing too special. All right, uh, what if you don't know in advance how long something will take? So <laughs> it's kind of a crapshoot, honestly. This and uh, the amount of memory you need are pretty hard to predict in advance sometimes. There are times where you can figure out in advance approximately how much you'll need. For example, if your program just involves filling a big matrix and then using an iterative solver um, to I guess, solve against that matrix, you'll know that the amount of memory you need is just going to be however big that matrix is. But if you're using, say, proprietary software or maybe bioinformatics software that doesn't really have anything, anything that you can access from the surface and you don't know, I guess, really even approximately how much it's going to use, it's really just trial and error. So maybe you could start with a wall time of a day and 64 gigabytes of memory. And if that's not enough, I usually just recommend that you double whatever resource you're falling short on until you do have enough of that. So if the 64 gigabytes was insufficient and your job ran out of memory, you could try it with 128 gigabytes. And if that's still not enough, you could do 256 and so on. Alrighty, so that looks like that's all the questions for now. Any more before I move on to showing you guys around the website? Oh, this is a good one. So unfortunately, uh, okay, I'll just ask the question here. For group file sharing, compare SG, FSLG, my group, sbatch, my script, versus sbatch dash dash gid. So sbatch, so what we're talking about here is running a script such that everybody in your file sharing group will have access to the files that it produces. So say you're a member of, what have I got here? Say I'm a member of FSLG VASP um, and I want everybody in that group to be able to access everything that my that my slurm script creates what i'll do actually let's let's get off of this compute node here what i can do for that is i say sg and this just i guess switches your group in essence So by default, anything that I create 
is going to be the group is going to be the same as my username. So you'll see here that I'm the owner and I'm also the group for all of these files. If I want the group associated with one of these files, for example, an output file to be FSLG VASP, for example, although I guess I'm not in that anymore. Let's say FSL apps. If I can spell it right, that'll help here. And run the command properly, of course. Oh, it already existed. Okay, so you see that the group here is FSL apps. So this is important for, I guess, sharing files between groups for those of us who aren't familiar with them. Um, Sbatch used to have a flag, dash dash gid, that you could use to ensure that everybody had access to whatever files you were going to produce. Unfortunately, that doesn't work anymore. Um, and from what it seems like, it's not going to work because it was a security vulnerability from the start. So what you need to do instead is you say sg whatever the group is, and then you use sbatch and submit the job. So at this point, unfortunately, this is the only way to do it that we know of. So in a sec, we should see, okay, there it is. So anybody who is a member of FSL apps is able to modify this file right here. But yeah, at this point, SG is unfortunately the only way to do that. All right, we've got how does the scheduler manage people using SALIC? And do I need to stay logged in while using SALIC? I, what happens if my connection gets dropped for some reason? So the scheduler manages SALIC pretty similarly to SBatch. I think it just tries to start you a little bit faster though, because it's interactive. That said, if there's nowhere that your job is able to run, um, it's just gonna have to, it'll hang for a little while while it's waiting for resources to free up. So for example, let's say I request just a ton of resources um, and I'll just do a lot of memory as an example. I'll do, let's say 1200 gigabytes. And you'll see this is just gonna hang for a long, long time until one of the, uh, one of the huge memory nodes lets me on essentially. So SALIC is faster, but really it's kind of the same as SBatch. Uh, do I need to stay in, stay logged in while using SALIC? So if the, if the pipe gets broken while you're using it, I believe it's gone. Um, but if you're using something like Tmux and you exit Tmux or screen, uh, then you can detach from that screen or the connection can go down and you can log back into the supercomputer, um, reattach to that Tmux or screen session and resume, I guess, using that SALIC shell that you had. All right, any more, more questions before I dive into the website? Oh, it is a supercomputer, TensorFlow or MXNet. So TensorFlow, I believe it's not installed centrally, but you can install that with pip. MXNet, I'm pretty sure it's not because I, it doesn't sound familiar. And usually, usually I'll have at least, I guess, come across the name of something if, if we've installed it. Yeah, TensorFlow, if you have any trouble with either of those, open up a ticket and I can help you get it installed. All right, if there's no more questions, I'll just go on to showing you guys a little bit of how to use the website here.
Oh, optimization. Yeah, sorry, I missed that question. Um, oh yeah. Optimization is quite the game. Um, the first thing that you wanna do is make sure that you're using the right software and the right algorithm, of course. Um, but there's, there is a lot that you need to be kind of aware of as far as optimization. So I would say the first thing is from the start, when you know what you want to do with your program, make sure to choose the right framework for that. So again, if you're doing something with big matrices um, and you have to have really fine control over what goes on, Fortran is probably going to be the right choice. If you need to do something where you're manipulating lists um, or something that an operate something like an operating system, you would use C or maybe C++. Uh, if you're just doing generalized math and you want it pretty fast, but you don't need to squeeze out the last 10% or whatever it may be, Julia might be the right choice for that sort of thing. Um, The next thing that you want to do is make sure to use smart algorithms. Make sure to only iterate as many times as you need to. Make sure to cut away any fluff from objects if you happen to be using those. Try to pack your data into as little space as possible. And the other thing is when you're compiling, try to compile for the hardware that you're going to be using. So for example, if you want to use AVX, AVX2, because you're doing a lot of matrix stuff, uh, you would compile with that. But yeah, optimization is, it's such a big problem that I might need to, I might need to talk more, I guess, specifically about your problem with optimization, because that's, that's a big can of worms, I suppose. All right, so I'll go ahead and show you guys the website here since we're running out of time. All right, so there are some good resources here. The first one I would point you to is under documentation. You'll see this job script generator right under job submission. So this is really the easiest way to create a job script. So let's say I want eight cores and I want this to run on one node since I'm not using MPI. I don't need any GPUs, but I do need a lot of memory. Let's say I have four gigabytes per core. That's gonna be a total of 32 gigs. And let's say I want a day and a half of wall time here. So, and I also want to get an email at the end. So here you would just type in your email. And down here, you'll see a little script. And what you'll do is you can just take this, copy paste it, and then put all of your work right down at the bottom here. And this will take care of all the, all the little slurm flags so that you don't have to you don't have to worry about the syntax or the format or whatever it may be. So again, that's under documentation, job script generator. The other thing that I'd like to point out is under software and tools, we have this Unix tutorial. So this will take a little bit of time to go through, but um, it's definitely worth it and it'll pay off because you'll be much more fluent in both using the supercomputer and just navigating in Unix generally. So the one that you'll want to look at if you're installing your own software is this chapter seven, compiling Unix software packages. This will go into the basics of configure, make, make install, that sort of thing. All right, the other thing that I want you to know about is open support ticket. And you would normally have to sign in to do this, 
I don't think this is the right password anyway, so we're not, I'm not going to. But uh, if you need help uh, and you can't figure it out with Google or whatever it may be, just open up a support ticket and we'll try to get you, try to get you sorted out. All righty. So the other thing is on your account page. Let's go ahead and pop out of this. And I will show you guys the account page here. Okay. All right, so this is a little bit different of a view than you guys will have um, because I'm an administrator. So I see all of this right here, but you guys will see all of this. Um, and maybe the most important thing here is gonna be your job statistics page. This is where you can go to kind of see what your job's performance was over the past little while. So if I head over to job stats, I've got all these columns here. And this just shows the name of the job, job ID, um, how well I use the CPU, how well I used memory, that kind of stuff. Um, you can see that I've been, I've been doing pretty bad at this. Uh, the red here is bad. My CPU utilization was 0%. Uh, my memory utilization has been a little bit better, but here it's say 9%. So if you're wondering how much memory your jobs actually used, or how well they were actually utilizing the CPUs, this job statistic page is the, uh, is the place to go. So once you log in, it'll be over here on the, uh, on the left. All right, um, so we are out of time. Any last quick questions before, we, before we're done? Alrighty, if not, thank you guys very much for listening. Sorry about the uh, technical glitches early on there. Um, and we hope to see you guys next time.